Hi, I'm Teresa Wingfield. I'm from Austin, Texas. It's nice to see all of y'all here. Recently, I spoke with two 17-year-olds who are working at a fast food restaurant in Austin. One of them's a senior in high school. The other said, recently dropped out of high school. Both of them said they work 32 hours a week. Um, they filled out lots of applications, but this was the only business that responded to them. I couldn't help but wonder, how could this have been a better experience for these young workers? And what is the future of their work? What is their future working life going to be like? Is this the beginning of their work life? Or are they going to go off to college and come back? So as I started thinking about this, I was um, looking and found that there's a lot of conversation that higher education isn't really meeting the needs of the next generation of professionals. But as I was thinking about these two young workers, I thought, well, it's broader than professionals in higher ed. It's actually earlier than that. And so I, the problem really is students are not prepared for the workplace. Employers I spoke with said that the students that they hire have plenty of computer skills, but they don't really have any job skills, and they don't really understand how to interact or communicate at work. They don't know what expectations there are in the workplace, like showing up on time, staying their whole shift, how to dress, or how to communicate with others at work. But employers and school counselors both told me that exposure to the real world through internships really makes a difference. So just to be clear, an internship is a learning experience that introduces an intern to workplace skills and workplace culture. Usually internships are short term and not too many hours per week. Um, in general, when I was doing research, I found that in both the United States and internationally, there are lots of internships available for young workers, and young people will be in high school or college age even. Um, and so this suggests that employers really are interested in mentoring uh, emerging youth workers. Unfortunately, the internships I found are usually offered only in the summer. They're usually unpaid, actually mostly unpaid. And um, they can be scattered around town, elsewhere in the state, or somewhere else in the country, or even international. And the employers and educators I talked to said they really feel like this kind of is more viable or favors those students who already have plenty of family, financial, or transportation support. This leaves out, as you can imagine, a wide swath of students who could benefit from an internship experience. So at the beginning of my research, I started with something I'm really familiar with. I interviewed and, well, I surveyed and talked to a whole bunch of uh, high school students who are on the school and news, uh, high school newspaper and yearbook staffs, as well as the faculty advisors. And both the students and the advisors felt like being on the newspaper staff or the yearbook staff really provided an in-school internship kind of experience. Together, they're creating a final product, and they're working with applied, real-world applied learning kind of things, like creating schedules and meeting deadlines and working together as a group or speaking to unfamiliar people and having to conduct themselves professionally. Um, I also spoke with some educators and administrators about Austin School District's uh, career technical education program that is for Title I schools. So this program actually offers the students in their final year uh, an off-campus internship experience 
that's part of the program. Unfortunately, this, uh, require, this program requires up to a five-year commitment of students starting like in eighth grade. And it has very little room for exploration and it's closed to new students. So it's really very restrictive. So you heard me mention Title I schools. Well, that's a federal designation of schools that have at least 40% of the student body is part of the free and reduced lunch program. And in Austin, that's nearly half of the schools. So that's over 5,000 students in high school, which translates to about over 700, about 700 um, seniors just alone at those schools that are designated Title I schools. Of course, all the schools in the district uh, serve this population, just not at the same percentages. Many of these students, as you can imagine, um, have a lot of things going on after school. A lot of them have jobs in the afternoon after school or on the weekends to help with family expenses or they're helping take care of younger siblings after school and in the evenings because a parent's still at work or the parent might be working two jobs. Or these students, some of them are even uh, helping support one or more children of their own. Additionally, these, many of these students ride, catch, have to catch the city bus on the way home or they walk home together in groups. As you can see, that leaves very little room for flexibility after school. So what can we do for these students? Well, to help fill the void of opportunities, I propose bringing the off-campus internship to school. Utilizing the mobile classroom model, we can bring an employer and workplace to the high school to create an on-site paid internship. Unlike other internships, this would bring a self-contained mobile workplace to the campus. It would in include an employer, an independent teacher, and all the equipment and supplies that are needed for the internship. Schools are crowded. They don't have extra room. They don't have the extra money for equipment. It's very simple. This internship would also, unlike others, fit within the school day and the school calendar to keep from interfering with all their other things they've got after school. You can imagine with a venture like this how many stakeholders must be involved, right? Starting with the students themselves, their parents and guardians, the school principal and counselors, the sc school district administrators, local businesses and sponsors, and other community partners. So how do we get something like this off the ground? Well. The initial phase would begin at one Title I high school, and we would uh, engage community partners to help repurpose a school transportation bus, city transportation bus, and recruit a business partners to participate. We would be talking with businesses that are part of the merging fields, the most uh, the fastest growing fields over the next decade so we can best prepare the students. It might be emerging technologies, market analysis, or digital media and communications. A preliminary project suggestion from a highly regarded professional at IBM Watson was to have a team member from that group engage students in the ideation process for, say, a chatbot for South by Southwest, you know, the big tech and media conference that's held in Austin every year. Another possibility could be a, approaching a market analysis organization to lead students through the strategizing of, say, launching a new service or product. Each internship program could potentially uh, parallel a six to nine week school grading period so that we can, over the course of the year, we can fit in successive different internships, allowing the students plenty of different change and opportunities to explore and gain experience. Each of these internships would include the business's branding on all touch points. It's essentially like a branch office for the business, right? And at the end of the program, the students would get some branded 
item, merchandise, something that would actually be an outward expression or sign of their achievement. We kind of think these would become a sought-after badge of honor, if you get my drift. So subsequent phases would include expansion to more high schools, and we would hope to develop a regular, consistent, rotating series of internships and business partners um, so that we could continue helping students gain workplace skills and exposure to a variety of potential career options. Additionally, we'd help students develop a competitive edge and the confidence to maximize their opportunities, whether it's at their current fast food job or at their careers beyond college. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Claudia Rochman, and we have Alvaro I'll Soto. And Teresa, you met already, whom we put on the spot as our student to show you her outcome from our class that we offered this spring semester at the Texas State University in San Marcos. Teresa is a graduate teaching assistant, but a graduate student in our program. She's been with us for a little bit over a year, almost two. Um, Alvaro is currently working in San Francisco. He was in Austin for the last four five year, years, five years. Um, working at IBM, but he's now at Figure 8 in San Francisco, so we are delighted to have the opportunity to still now employ him, but since he's on the West Coast and Austin is a little further down south, we have to fly him in for a weekend um, to teach this course. And I am, as you can see, um, the coordinator of this program. I run the communication design program. We have about 40 graduate students in the program about 400 in the undergraduate program, and we sit within a school of art and design, which has a total of around 1,000 students of a university of 40,000 students. Our program is non-traditional, and what that means is that we are offering courses that are happening on either weekends, if students would like to go with a face-to-face engagement. We also offer classes that are hybrid, which means over the semester, which for us is 16 weeks long, students meet eight times out of the semester every other week. And the weeks that they do not meet, they actually have to meet online or submit asynchronously online, whatever they created. And then we also have traditional, or I guess I call them traditional by now, history courses, which are completely online courses, um, also spanning over the 16 weeks. Um, we do a lot of work through technology that is available. We have an internal system that we're supposed to use, which is the Sakai-based model. But we actually prefer, that's why Alvaro is smirking a little bit. You can ask him questions about that later. That's why I think it's interesting to have an industry perspective on this um, topic. We do utilize a lot of external um, technology just because it's easier and students prefer that. We do a lot of projects cross-disciplinary. Um, that means that we're bringing in other programs, um, primarily out of the business sector, but also out of the engineering area. Um, but also we have a very strong um, design for social uh, force, but also a um, social workforce area, and we try to combine a lot of our class efforts with those other programs on campus as well. We also bring in industry experts um, in order to open up to our students the opportunities that we have at hand. Austin is a 1.5 million city. Um, we've grown tremendously over the last couple of years. We host the largest um, interactive conference now, South by Southwest, every spring. So there's a lot of momentum. We were just named as one of the top cities to live in in the United States. So there's a lot of momentum going on, and we're trying to catch that with our very traditional brick and mortar school. A couple things about this course that we offered. Um, the course that we offered um, we'll get there, it's okay. The course that we offered was a weekend seminar course. Um, it is called Design Entrepreneurship. Yep. It was the first time that we offered this course. Alvaro and I came up with it last fall because we felt that that was something that we wanted to add to our curriculum for our students. Um, and we offered it as a weekend seminar course so that Alvaro could be in town since he's not living in town anymore. 
um, but also to because our students are non-traditional, they don't necessarily live in town, so that students could come in in order to participate in this course. So let's start a little bit of a discussion about this course. Um, Teresa, why did you actually decide to enroll in this course? Well, I went back to grad school to get caught up on everything that was happening new in this field, and this is cutting edge kind of stuff. And so I thought the class would be incredible, especially having Alvaro who is in, out in the field, a, as well as all of the different people that were going to be Skyping in and, yeah. Alvaro, can you talk a little bit about the definition for you for design entrepreneurship? Why was that important to bring to? Yeah, I think it's, um, if we take a step back, so I, I'm a designer by trade. I went to industrial design, then I got a master's in design and technology up in New York. And so I started my career as a designer in technology, um, digital designer, UX designer. Um, but then I got very interested in, and then I went and worked for IBM after a couple of years um, working in New York um, in different agencies. Um, and I got very interested in the business side of um, design or the business side of what designers can bring to the table. Um, and we needed to grow our program at IBM Design from um, 10 designers that we started in the program back in 2013 to what is today, I don't know the number, I could be saying something wrong, but let's say 2,000 designers that we hire over a period of three years. And over all of that interviewing, um, what I noticed um, is that the skills that designers were coming uh, with were very important skills, um, but they lacked um, some of the more nuanced um, abilities to be able to um, thrive in an organization like IBM. And I think it's true even as startups like the one that I am today. And so when uh, we started, I started teaching uh, a UX course, usually um, either uh, merging a UX course with artificial intelligence, obviously because that is my background. And, and I, I didn't think that that was the right course to teach at a school that is trying to make a difference. And so when we proposed design entrepreneurship was Oh, and then before coming here, I took another um, um, year off to go and get an MBA at Texas, uh, UT, uh, the University of Texas in Austin. And then when I came back, what I realized is, okay, we could do something like the MBA, but for designers, and what would that look like? Is it just an MBA for designers, an MBA class for designers? Um, and what I came to realize is that there's a lot that designers in their own trade and their own schools can bring to the entrepreneurship uh, mentality. Uh, and those things are things like um, um, uh, communication. And so we are in a communication program. And a lot of times when you want to present ideas so that others buy those ideas, convince others that those ideas are good, you need skills to communicate. And those skills are something that designers come with uh, from other courses. So what if we could combine uh, communication skills with some entrepreneurship skills and then create a class that was combining those two? And I think key to that was not only hearing it from me, but um, from others uh, in the industry. And that's why we invited um, uh, the, two, the two guest uh, speakers or um, uh, instructors. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, how did we bring them to the campus? Uh, well, we, we Skyped them in, uh, not Christian Helms uh, and Debbie Millman. I don't know if you know, maybe, maybe some of you know Debbie Millman, but she, she's a very uh, renowned uh, designer um, in, in New York. She hosts a, um, a podcast uh, called Design Matters. Um, and um, I, I met her through an acquaintance, and we wanted to bring it in, but obviously she was not going to fly like I flew to Austin, San Marcos. Uh, but, so we had Skype classes with them, and each, each, each weekend that we will meet, they will Skype in for 15 minutes, and they will be co-teaching the class with me. So I prepared the class, and then we will just uh, have the, the other instructors give, give the students feedback on their ideas. Who else did you bring into the class? Christian Helms, uh, who is also a designer slash entrepreneurship in, um, in Austin. Uh, he owns a brand studio. Uh, and we also brought um, other like 
So this one's where like all the all the weekends they were coming and co-teaching the class with me, um, and then I, we also invited um, uh, classmates from my MBA program to teach some of those courses that are more skill-based. So how do startups work? How to raise money? All of those things. We just invited friends of mine who will come for 30 minutes and just give a pitch on how to do that. Um, cool. Thank you. Um, Teresa, could you compare this class to any of the other classes you took in that program? It's like completely different from any other class, not only because of all of these professionals from all across the country, uh, including Cynthia Lawson, too, oh, that, yeah. that Skyped in and contributed or actually came in person. It was um, different than a design studio where you're crafting something with type and everything. This was more like a uh, professional workshopping and um, professional seminars with the people who would come and tell us, um, give us ba basically a workshop mm -hmm. on different things from venture capitalists coming, business, digital marketing, and uh, just the whole range. The Go ahead. The other thing, the only thing that I felt like was this, uh, that might have been missing because it was uh, so comprehensive was that it was um, a different change because it was so different it was um, hard for some of us to we there was discomfort about learning to not be do, make crafting an artifact but going through all this research and developing something completely new and different I want to pick up on that a little bit we had that long discussion last night about fun should all learning be fun or should learning be fun while you were in this course did you experience it as your most fun course you had ever taken or was it the most of ours making a little face there, so. <laughs> what was your experience? Was it a fun course while you were in it? I think that depends on that definition as we were talking about last night, what is the definition of fun? And I think it was, um, along with the discomfort, we also knew that we were learning something completely different. And so uh, by the end of it, there was a great deal of satisfaction, like that mastery that we were talking about last night. We may not have mastered anything, but we went through something really difficult and came out at the other end with a completely new understanding. Cool. Alvaro, why do you think a class like this is important to offer? Clearly, you have probably other things to do than flying cross-country for the weekend to teach a course, so you must really enjoy teaching this course. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I do en enjoy just teaching in general, but um, th there's something like nagging where you know that you could um, you could give a course like this that is needed in an university that no university is doing or very few universities and not having not do it is just feels it feels wrong uh, but I think most important than that is just that where students come out like presentations like the one that Teresa I gave um, when when she started the presentation will look completely different that was not the way she started um, and so it's it's interesting to take designers that are used to going and uh, hiding in the rooms and creating an artifact and then bringing it as in like, here's my artifact and my typography, uh, and then just having them go out and talking to people. And then that is their project, uh, talk to people and come back with an idea and then iterate on that idea. So I think that that's, that's, it was challenging for them and it, I enjoyed, I had fun. Cool. Um, Teresa, you mentioned a little bit that if you would have changed anything or what was missing in the course, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Like if you... Oh, I think maybe just a little introduction that explains that we're going to go through this period of discomfort and it's, we're going to have a learning curve and just kind of, you know, slow, painful, and then we'll get, get to the other end. That might be the only thing. Do you feel like you need to defend that? Uh, huh. Well, I guess I'm not a, a educator by like trade or by education. I didn't go to school to be an educator. Um, and so definitely I may, I may jump through a lot of things that educators would um, just smack me uh, for not doing. Um, but I also think that challenging them to find their own answers is important. Yeah, oh yeah. And so when they ask me, um, what should the format of the presentation should be? I'm like, you can dance, you can bring a deck, you can create a video, whatever you want. It's not my problem as long as you communicate your idea well. And so that is an extreme discomfort that they go through that I think it's necessary because nobody's going to tell you what the format of your presentation is when you're at work. Yeah. 
how do you manage to teach while you work? You have a pretty, I would call it, high-profile job at Figure 8. So how do you manage? Yeah, I need to go work after this. <laughs> there is just starting. The day is just starting. Um, I, I just have to, well, the program is it's, it's, it's very interesting in that I travel just uh, one weekend. So we have a long weekend seminar. So it's not that I go back every week. That would be too hard. Um, and so every month um, I fly on, on a Friday. Uh, then we teach all Saturday um, and all Sunday. And then I go back. Um, and how do I manage? Well, if, we, if I didn't have Slack, it would be very hard. Um, if I didn't have um, Medium, it would be very hard because um, I don't like to get into and apologies for those. I know that a lot, you may be one of the owners of uh, the other technology uh, <laughs> products for professors, um, but it's definitely nothing like just uh, talking to the students via Slack. So that's how I do it. Cool. Teresa, how has this experience changed you in your perspective of communication design? Has it? Well, Yes, I was already kind of leaning this direction in my job before I started grad school of wanting to be earlier and have the designer included earlier in the process of things that were being changed. But this class really did reinforce that idea that the designers have a lot to contribute way at the beginning of the conception of uh, changes within an organization or outside of it. But it also made it really clear to all of us in the class that designers can it empowered all of us to feel to, uh, to know that we could and to have experienced it that we could initiate change on our own if you were to get in this last question then I want to open this up to everybody else um, if you could change this class and I hope you will with us again Alvar how would you change it would you change anything about it well I'm teaching a course this semester called design futures um, it's different. Obviously, it's not about entrepreneurship, but it, it teaches students to think about ideas, obviously, in the future through research. Um, and one of the things that we did um, in the last project, which is the one that they're finishing, is putting them in groups. And to me, I thought that that was just so obvious. You know, in, in, at work, you work in groups. Um, and I think in, in my MBA program, I also worked in groups. but for some reason, they hadn't worked in groups, and everybody loved it. So um, <laughs> we, the way that we will change it is we will put them in, in groups. Uh, that's one of them. I haven't thought about other things that I would change, except for who else is going to be invited um, uh -huh, to that, it that can complement the things that I don't know, uh, which is very important. Do you think it's important to have others there to complement you? to open it up? Is, was that a big part of your? Yeah, because when, like, again, it's, it's, I model it all after work. Like, nobody at work can do everything. And so pretending that a professor can just give all of these things, um, I would, if I was going to do it on my own, I would just have to do it by the books. Like, go and say, what is it? And then I'm going to tell them. But it's not going to feel natural. It's not going to feel authentic in the way I say it, and I think that that is extremely important. So compliment is bringing other people that can authentically talk about those topics. Cool. Thank you. Well, um, I'd like to open this up. Thank you, too, for um, presenting and showing and sharing some of your thoughts. Are there any questions out of the audience? Hopefully. There's one. I don't know if we have a mic and if I should worry. No, we don't have a mic. Yes. All right. Uh, what I was wondering about the group work uh, is uh, do you think that uh, it's possible uh, to do group work right away? Or do you think that uh, you need some blocks first uh, uh, in this kind of program? Um. Before, before the students can really do uh, authentic, uh, meaningful group work? Yeah. I think authentic meaningful group work is letting them struggle through how to divide the work themselves and so i will put them on right away i think obviously you need to be there to guide them when things are not working that's why instant communication with them is so important i, I don't mind if they send me a slack message and say we don't know how to divide this work right now and i just give them a suggestion like just divide it by your strengths how does that feel 
And so I think that letting them figure it out, um, um, it's one of the things that is, when we, in IBM Design, um, they have this um, two-month program called Design Camp for every designer that is coming into the program. And in Design Camp, they basically um, teach um, students how to uh, become professionals. <laughs> um, and one of the things that they do is they put them in groups. And there are um, a lot of um, struggle that they go through. And they put them in groups right away. And so how do you collaborate with others? And nobody can teach that. You just have to dive in. So that's what I will do. I will just put them in immediately. I will follow up on that one because I'm curious, and I know you and I have this discussion, and we um, sometimes dis not disagree on it, but we, we've had arguments about it in the sense of would that be better or worse? Um, should it be opening up between other programs so that it's not just communication design students, but we're now inviting students in from social practice course or the engineering courses or an MBA program, business students? Yeah. It so it is I think that that would be a good idea. That one of the reasons why we, when, when we tell students, you use your skills and then again, go and do that, um, then that's what they're going to do. And so if we divide them in, if we put them with other students like engineering and business, designers are going to end up creating the presentation and the logo, and then the engineers, the code, and then nobody's going to stretch any sort of discomfort or going into the process of, uh, investigating other areas. So I think the reason why, even though I think ultimately it's a good idea in some other way, um, um, in this course they need to be able to um, get to know what is other um, things, in primarily business, because that's what we're asking them mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Cool. Are there more questions from the audience? Tough to see. Nothing. There's one, yes. Yes, there is a grade at the end. How do you That's grade a very this class? Good question, because <laughs> I, I am really bad at grading. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, it is, it is not simple to do, um, but the, ultimately what you want is you're giving them a goal. Um, and the goal for them is to, most of the, on all of those projects, is to be able to um, communicate effectively. And obviously, I give them some guidelines on the things that they need to have in whatever medium they choose. So first of all, they have to check mark all of those things. So an example is um, you need to have your primary research. You need to have your secondary research. You need to articulate both of those uh, very well. And you need to fit it in a presentation that takes 10 minutes. Uh, you also need to create a prototype, and you need to um, uh, um, a, a prototype, and then you need to uh, have testing. So there's a couple of things that obviously uh, we have taught them what it needs to do. So that needs to be packed in those presentations, like when you go and talk to investors. Um, and after that, what most of the time, what we, what I end up doing, because I agree that is difficult, is um, um, inevitably, I start benchmarking, right? So I'll look at one student, and um, based on that student and what I think is the uh, example of that student, and then I grade the rest. Now, one of the things that we, I do in the first one is everybody gets the same grade. They don't know, but everybody gets the same grade. Um, and so some of them, I, and I tell them, this is the presentation that is an example of how you should present. Um, and then the next presentation, now they ac at least have an example of what I was looking for. And sometimes it's not just one presentation, sometimes it's examples of different ones. And I tell them, okay, you did this very well, you did this very well, and you did this very well. If one of you had combined this, it would be the perfect presentation, an A, right? So, and then I tell them, well, everybody has the same grade on this project. The next one is not gonna be like that. More questions? Yes. What 
<laughs> what was in, well, Teresa oh. <laughs> is one of the uh, very good. Well, I, I so one Teresa, uh, but I'll, I'll mention uh, um, another one. Um, Teresa, um, the reason why I liked it is it was because it was kind of meta, right? We were teaching them how to be, how to prepare for the workforce. Uh, through designers, through business skills. And then Teresa came up with this idea on how to teach high school students to prepare for the workforce. And I thought that the buzz was, was a, a, a good idea and she did her research very well. Um, she went through a lot of discomfort and then came on the other side, which is what I like. There was a couple of other ideas. There was one um, for school um, STEM um, schools. So it was a little bit like I don't know if you know what Creative Mornings is, um, but in the U.S. there's a, a kind of like a conference style, but they do chapters. So every city hosts their own Creative Morning. They meet at seven, uh, and a company hosts. Usually, it's a company hosts the Creative Morning, and then there's a speaker that comes invited, and then. Um, there's a person that owns Creative Mornings, and she owns the brand, she owns the communication, but then everybody takes care of those chapters. And so she used the same model to create chapters for schools in different cities where different um, businesses or different, um, if you are a creative person, you can host your own STEM school. Uh, or if you're a dancer, you can host your own like dance courses. Yeah, uh, I thought that that was very neat. Um, there was a huge variety, though. Was what was variety. very interesting to see, classes in the graduate program have eight students enrolled, and there was a huge variety of what students proposed. Yeah, there were some apps. Obviously, some they end up creating an app. Some, some of them are apps. Um, and obviously, because I create apps, it's natural for them to also um, feel that that's a good way to interact with me. But I love projects. Uh, in technology that do not come up with an app, right? But come up with other solutions that are not an iPhone app. Yeah, one went into voting, um, so trying to support and building a network to make voting easier and um, find candidates easier in the process for political arenas. Another one was the city of Austin um, and how to find art um, easier. So yeah. that was one. I think one thing that we missed um, when we started um, uh, we gave everyone three themes um, so that everybody could, they were going to create their own business idea, but we gave them prompts. Uh, one uh, was um, Austin. The city of Austin is losing its identity. The city of Austin is known for, um, what is the motto? Keep Austin weird. Keep Austin weird. And it's and then really a weird, crazy city. It used to be. It used to be. So there we, go. <laughs> we thought that the city of Austin is losing its identity. It will be a local project. Um, and yes, most of them ended up being local projects, whether it were political engagement or businesses to revive art, and that was one of those. Um, the other prompt was um, uh, women in position of power. Um, and so how to bring women to position of power, and that's why girls STEM education and that program of the chapters came about. And then the, the third, third one. one um, was higher education. Oh, higher education. Um, and so the students of tomorrow are not well prepared. And that was the prompt. Um, and then you have to come up with whatever idea. Um, Teresa came up with this one. There was another project that was about how to um, guide um, first generation uh, students, so migrants, uh, and they are uh, first born in the United States, but their parents probably didn't go to um, higher education. And these migrants, um, the, the research that she did is that a lot of them, and she was a first generation American herself, uh, and she was the first one in her family to go to uh, a graduate program. They don't know how to uh, get funding. Obviously, in the US, you need to get, like, um, you need to pay for school, so you need to get, figure out where the grants are, uh, where the financial aid is. Uh, and she created an app for that to uh, help first generation students. And that's been a big discussion for us because we don't want to go forward with the same three prompts. We're going to create new prompts. And these prompts we felt were very carefully selected, but also very well received. So um, I feel that it's very important to make sure that you're going to hit that sweet spot, but also offer diversity in those prompts that you're giving your students. 
Yeah, I think students today are very, or this generation is, is very interested in, 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 in local, is very interested in things that are passionate to them, um, political engagement. Um, this course that I'm teaching this semester, a lot of them are uh, creating ideas about um, the future of political engagement and how to uh, bring more people to the polls, for example, or how to make the polls more secure so that there's no voter fra fraud. So I think that um, I'll keep the same theme so that they work in, in, in projects that are passionate, that they have passion for. Yeah, very important. Great question. More questions? I think the challenge is I wouldn't know how to teach that, and I don't think I would like to do it. Um, and so I think, uh, so maybe, like for example, a very structured course um, that has very specifics on um, the traditional, like what you should achieve, and then there's all of these um, more traditional approach to pedagogy. Um, I think there's the right people to teach it. I, I don't think I'm the right person to teach it, so that's why I wouldn't do it, but I'm sure that the course can take uh, many formats. Uh, I think the critical point um, is back to that authenticity of teaching, uh, which a lot of the times is more them investigating than me telling them anything. I speak very little in class. Um, I just say like a couple of words and they need to speak the majority of the time. Um, and so I'm not, a teacher, I'm more like I'm there guiding them when they feel scared about what I am asking them to do, um, but I don't give them any lecture. Um, and I think that that is what I bring to the table, but I obviously think that there are many uh, different types of courses that uh, wouldn't work in this way. I can probably elaborate a little bit on that one. We offered the same course over the summer in our undergraduate program. Um, so that had 20 students per each course in there. And that course was offered by a different faculty member. He's an uh, associate professor within our program. He's been there for 10 years and he runs our interactive program. And he made this course an app course so that it literally turned into define your own problem. Um, I think he actually picked up the prompt from Austin so that students had to pick a content perspective to Austin specific, but then they designed an app. Um, they did not include any of the business sides of it, nor did they. They did invite at the end of it for their final presentation, venture capitalist out of Austin. We have a huge um, group of um, uh, venture capitalists in Austin, um, and we invited three of them to come to listen to the pitches to just see what that was about. Um, but it was a very different way of how the course was taught, and it was a very, I would call it, um, it was a very broad level of how problems were tackled. They were not going into a whole lot of detail, um, and there was not a whole lot of depth also coming from other areas, which was, I personally, since I had observed both of these courses, um, definitely coming from bringing in other areas. That was the very successful part of that course at the graduate level, but it's also graduate level course. That was the whole perspective of it. Um, we will offer this undergraduate course now as an honors course, and an honors course on our campus means that any student can take it. They will get honors credit for it. They can take it as a free elective. Um, and we've been told over and over that this is a course that the university is really interested in. Um, it's going to be interesting to see out of the 40,000 students that we have how quickly it's going to fill up. We reserve 10 spots just for our design students, but we'll see who the other 10 are. I'm assuming, honestly, that it's going to be primarily engineers and business majors. But I'll let you know in the summer. <laughs> it will fill. That one I'm not concerned about. More questions? This is a great discussion. Anything else? Do people in the audience have experience with bringing in industry experts to teach parts of their courses? I'm curious now. I'm turning it on you. <laughs> yes, please.
I'm curious now, since you're from the Netherlands, and I definitely do know that you have an easier way implementing something like this in your curriculum than we for sure have in the United States, but how, how much leeway do you have there and how much... Is there, is there, do you have a lot of um, discussion about why these courses are important or do you have support to bring these courses forward? Yeah, yeah, thank you, very interesting. Anybody else in the audience who's experiencing something similar? I do have to th something about um, the evaluation over time. Um, I, so I started teaching at um, the New School Parsons in New York um, where I had my master's and after I graduated from that master's I started working but also teaching there. Um, and I taught a course that was already designed. That was my first teaching course, so I couldn't say no. Um, but when I proposed one, um, it was my first experience, like saying, hey, I want to teach something like this. And I remember th they, them saying, sure, this course sounds interesting. Let's put it, it may get into in 2014 or 15. And that was like 2011. <laughs> and I was like, I may not be here. I may be somewhere else. I may not be interested in this course anymore. Um, and so one of the things that are very interesting with Claudia that she has so much this ability to uh, change courses. And I proposed a course like the Design Futures was just us over wine in Austin and saying, what should we teach next semester? And we came up with the Design Futures. And that was like the semester before where we were finishing design entrepreneurship. And then we taught Design Futures. And, and we, to me, it's more like an iter iterative startup. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. I'm sure the students will gain a lot of a course. Um, maybe it doesn't work because um, we don't think that they're learning in the way that we would like them to be, that the outcomes were not what we were expecting, um, or that it's just not fun for anybody. So we'll teach another course. Um, and that's the only way that I stay teaching there. And I fly. Well, you asked me why do I fly. I think the reason is because I'm able just to teach something and then change it if it doesn't work and I don't have to wait three years because I will not wait three years. <laughs> and that's probably something that I should address that we do in order for us to get classes on the books. Um, we do have to go through curriculum committees and we submit them and they are being reviewed by everybody first in the university then within the city then within even the state. Um, so th this is a long process. It is a three-year process and then in the fourth year you get it on the books. Um, but we have the flexibility of what we call special topics course, which are courses that you can put up on the books immediately um, if you have good reasons why this course is needed and what the students are getting out of it. And with a course such as Design Futures or Design Entrepreneurship, um, that is an easy reason to bring that forward and to also get that approved. So that's what we have done with, with quite a few of the courses that you have been teaching, and that is where my passion definitely sits. Mm -hmm. um, but then once you've taught that for more than two years, um, then you actually have to get it into the system so that it becomes a regular class. So eventually we will still have to do that. Once we've taught this too, too many times, we'll still go through the long process. But I honestly think where education is these days that you're not going to put up classes anymore that are going to be there for the next 10 years because who even knows if we still have a brick and mortar university in 10 years. Mm. But um, you gotta be careful to what side of the camp you would mention that what way, right? So that's definitely something to keep in mind, yes. I should get in trouble. Um, no, that's okay. <laughs> it's all fun, as long as it all stays fun. Are there more questions? Well, thank you guys so much.
It was lovely yep. to get to chat about this, even though we barely see you. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you, guys.